All right, it is 12.02. For the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Kayla Magruder, and I'm an admissions counselor here at Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. I want to first thank you all for coming to join us today for Dr. Reed's Public Health Discovery Seminar Series of Some Like It Hot, Protecting Health 7,000 Feet Underground. I am now going to hand it off to Dr. Reed. Awesome. Thank you, Kayla. I do want to say... If at any point anyone has questions or comments, please go ahead. Feel free to make them. I want this to be as interactive as possible. I am going to kind of share a story. Uh, so that part won't necessarily be um, interactive. But again, if you have questions, comments, please feel free to make them. So I'm like it hot, protecting health 7,000 feet underground. I guess I do want to share a little bit about myself and, and my background, my, my story. I'll be honest, uh, while I was an undergrad, I I really bought into the public health ideology of uh, prevention over treatment. So I was a huge fan of public health, but I wasn't totally sure what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be when I grow up. I still kind of joke. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I, you know, I'm kind of discovering that as I go. But um, I enrolled. I ended up being enrolled in in my home state, uh, University of Arizona, their Master's of Public Health program. And I I ended up enrolling in the Environmental and Occupational Health concentration. My my thought at that time was uh, to focus on the 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 interaction between environment and in the development of infectious diseases, uh, which, you know, a super interesting area, but for different reasons, uh, I was eventually, I have, my path led to occupational health. Uh, and really um, what happened was doors opened for me to, to, well, first it was an internship opportunity at a mine near Tucson, Arizona, and I, I, that wasn't my plan, but uh, again, the door opened and I walked through it and I realized, oh, you know, this isn't as uh, as bad as I thought. I could actually enjoy this. And uh, I'll say the rest is history. So uh, that that uh, field has been one that's taken me 7,000 feet underground, taken me to mines uh, internationally in Chile, for example, uh, taking me to mines that are 14,000 feet above sea level, uh, you know, and everything in between. And it's been a very rewarding field and career for me. I, um, it, it certainly um, upholds the, the uh, public health ideology or, or mantra, whatever you want to call it, of uh, prevention over treatment. So that's a little bit about me. I want to take you on a journey today, 7,000 feet underground. Um, so this is a mine. I'm going to, I'm going to play a few little videos. This is a mine in Southern Arizona. It is a, a shaft mine. Um, it, it will be, so it's not operational yet. They're still developing it. Uh, I guess to give a little bit of context, this is a project that's required billions and billions of dollars to, uh, to just develop and they haven't even pulled one ounce of copper out of the ground yet. <laughs> um, you know, think about the demands, the electrical demands of the future. We need a lot more copper and, and actually the university of Arizona has done research trying to estimate how much copper we need. If we're going to, if we're going to all drive electrical vehicles someday, which well, anyway, I guess, <laughs> We won't get into all of the logistics there, but just copper itself, they estimate that it, at least at our current rate of production with our current technologies, it would take 400 years for us to extract and refine enough copper <laughs> to for everyone to have electrical vehicles. So uh, we have some work to do uh, in terms of uh, improving our technology and the way we uh, the way we use copper. So. That's kind of the think of that as you think about the development of this mine. And as we take a little tour of this mine uh, going 7,000 feet underground, uh, the the demand that uh, by society, by our society to to extract and refine copper 
is what drives all of this. And you'll see the sorts of environments that these people work in. Uh, that's the that's the goal is for you to get an idea. So <clears throat> this is uh, us starting our journey 7,000 feet down. Okay. Very good. So <laughs> I apologize for my filmography with uh, a lot of this it, it's just kind of an experience here you you we get into this cage it's called a man bucket <laughs> you get into this uh this lift it's called a hoist and you it's kind of like an elevator although obviously not uh not quite the typical elevator and we start descending down at a certain rate that you can only descend or ascend at a certain rate because of the pressure change you don't want to damage your eardrums so here's our next segment. This is. So are you studying mining or body temperature? I'm guessing you know you're you're hoping maybe to work on you know the thirtieth floor level or something of a of a high rise building or maybe the hundredth I don't know whatever but uh, you know so these these workers they go down and this is the sort of elevator they go down in. So once we reach the bottom, then uh, this is the working level of this mine. So I want to ask, uh, why do you think there's so much water down there? <laughs> Just curious. Uh, there is a right answer, but uh, don't worry if you don't have the right answer. That's okay. Why do you think there's so much water down there? It's like it's raining, you know, pouring all the time down at this 7,000 foot level. Feel free to drop your answers in the Q&A and we'll announce them. Awesome. We got an answer from Lily like to see that good participation so so lily is right there that uh we're below the water table and that means that water pours in <laughs> you know it's gonna it seeks its level and it uh <clears throat> anyway so it, it's like it's raining all the time now we'll look at the next video and then i'm gonna share another little fun fact here So you can see that steam that's rising there off of that equipment. It's not just that that equipment is hot. So you saw the, the title of this presentation. I, I, I'm going to talk about heat and heat strain at this mine. Uh, the So when the, the that shaft was first sunk 7,000 feet down into the ground, and uh, I guess I'll, I'll share a little bit about that process. So basically what happens is they drill blast holes. They fill those blast holes with explosives. Boom. The, it fractures the rock. They have to clear out all that rock. And then they repeat the process. So that that is about 10 feet uh, every time they do that. And that happens about once a day. So 10 feet a day getting down to 7 thousand feet it takes a while it's a lot of effort to do that but as they were sinking this shaft when they reached a certain point not not even seven thousand i think it was four or five thousand feet below the surface they started running into heat issues uh, and i'll talk about that in a little bit uh, you know why that's the case but the rock surface temperatures in this mine are where well, they were originally 180 degrees Fahrenheit and the water pouring into the mine was 180 degrees Fahrenheit. 
that presents a unique challenge. <laughs> How do you protect people while they're working in that sort of environment? That's part of the reason we were there was to try and help with this issue. Now we're, now, now we're going to leave the mine. So at the beginning, you can hear them. Uh, that's how they communicate <laughs> is because uh, there's no phone. You know, there's no radio. Radio doesn't work underground. Um, so they have a, they call it a bell that they ring you. Know, it's a signal uh, to tell the, the person up at the top of the hoist with the hoist controls to ha- say, hey, pull us back up <laughs> to the surface. <laughs> You can see a, a duct, a, a large duct there. So that's one of the ways that we we try and deal with that heat issue is they chill. So they, it's really interesting. They have these chillers on the surface. Basically, they get truckloads and truckloads of ice that uh, <clears throat> every day <laughs> that they use to chill the air before they push it down into the mine to help keep it cooler. So some unique challenges there want to talk about briefly, and then uh, we'll talk about some of the work that we were doing. So when it, when it comes to public health, it's one reason why I, why I was drawn to environmental and occupational health is that we have an opportunity to, to evaluate exposures, health exposures in different environments, but also our goal is to try and modify the environment. And I'll talk a little bit more about why we like that over over other options, at least in this field. So uh, one of the ways I talked about is ventilation. And really, that's the primary method is chilling the air. So it's like a giant air conditioner uh, for the mind. <laughs> Interesting. You know, and it's amazing, again, the scale and the amount of resources being invested in this to try and meet demand for copper, for example. You know, could we modify workplace practices? We could, and they do some of that. With heat, there's something called work rest cycles. So you work a certain amount of time and then you take a break. The goal is we don't want to get so hot that we get something, a condition called heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Heat stroke is a medical emergency and many people have died from heat stroke. And so uh, it's one of those health risks that... uh, that can quickly lead to a fatality, which is kind of unique uh, when it comes to health exposures. <clears throat> Not totally unique, but um, but we are usually thinking about chronic conditions when we think of health exposures. Or we could have workers wear PPE. So you can see my, <laughs> my getup or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so what they put us in before we go underground, we've got boots for the water. There's uh, usually lots of water in underground mines. Uh, also steel-toed, if anything were to fall in there. Gloves. We've got these uh, coveralls with a highly reflective material on there so that equipment can see you. You don't get squished. <laughs> Hard hat. Safety glasses. A uh, a harness for uh, doing any work at height so that in case you do fall, you're caught. Uh, you and you... <laughs> We, pre- we don't prevent the fall, but we, we prevent the, the part where you meet the ground at high speeds. That's the part that we prevent. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you, though, uh, a little bit of what goes on with wearing more PPE. So I've had to wear this PPE before for my job. I want you to, to I'm going to put it on. I want you to watch and think about what the issues or challenges are with wearing more and more PPE. So So putting our controls at the worker level and relying on them to, to, you know, wear all of this stuff. So I'm going to put my headset kind of on my shoulders. Hopefully you can still hear me. Uh, You know, I've got my mic here and then I'm going to put some, some of this PP on. So again, think about what are the issues I'm going to speak. You may or may not uh, understand what I say though. So, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and start with my safety glasses. And I guess I better, next, I better go 
with my respirator. Actually, I'm going to switch this. <laughs> I forget the best order sometimes. So this is a half mask or half face respirator. I think my son was wearing this last. I forgot to check the straps. <laughs> I have a big fat head. And he's got the straps through here. Okay. Well, I, I won't do the back straps, but you kind of get the idea. My hard hat. Safety glasses. And earmuffs. So I'd just like to, to know, can you hear and understand me? Maybe you can. Uh, go ahead and put in the Q&A. Can you, or I guess in the Q&A, can you hear and understand me? Okay, so some say no, some say yes. We have a couple of yeses in the Q&A. Okay. Well, going to make a mess here. Okay. So so you could hear and understand me, some of you. Um, imagine being in an environment, earplugs or earmuffs, that's noisy. <laughs> you probably wouldn't hear or understand. So... Uh, also, <laughs> for those who have ever worn uh, safety glasses, what usually happens to them <laughs> over time? <laughs> or, or imagine, I mean, your, your regular glasses are going to have the same issues. You know, those who wear regular glasses, uh, prescription glasses, have the same issues. It's just um, ours, these are made of plastic, and so the issues... Um, happen a little bit more quickly they'll get foggy what else i don't know that you'll be able to see mine these have had better days but um they'll get scratched up for example so if we ask people to wear all this ppe they can't hear as well they can't see as well and they can't speak communicate as well <laughs> Those are all issues. If you're working in a, a dangerous environment where you've got heavy equipment, you've got machines, you've got all these other things going on, those are issues. So to to try and control some risks and some hazards, we've introduced other hazards. So that's one reason we try and stay away from, from personal controls, and in this case, PPE. <laughs> So I want to, I'm going to talk a little bit about these two things and some work that we did on better ways to measure heat strain. Before we talk about it, I want to clarify. So heat stress is usually, it's, it's a factors that lead to our core temperature rising. We have, uh, so there's metabolic heat. So the harder you work, the, the more metabolic heat your body's going to generate. That's an issue. There are environmental factors. So think of the mine. <laughs> the rock surface temperatures are 180 degrees. The water is 180 degrees. The air isn't quite that hot, but it's still really hot. And if you have certain clothing, now this this clothing isn't isn't that bad. You know, the coveralls, it's not going to uh, add that much to thermal loading in your body, but it does add a little bit. Heat strain is your body's response the body's response and how it deals with that, how it tries to regulate and balance that thermal loading. So your body's saying, wow, it's getting hot. What am I going to do uh, you know, to, to deal with this? Uh, and you, know, we, we could, you could probably tell me, I'll just for the sake of time, mention a few of these, these things. What is the body going to do when it gets hot? Sometimes I like to think about the reverse thing to help me understand. So if you think about when it gets cold, you shiver. So with heat, there's no opposite of it. You're just not shivering. Your blood goes from your extremities to the core. So the body is always trying to protect the core 
That's the goal, your organs. So <laughs> when it's cold, your body basically says, good luck, fingers and toes and you know, ears and nose and <laughs> whatever other extremities. Good luck. You know, hopefully you're still alive once once things warm back up. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to protect the organs. And so the blood, the body moves your blood into the core to help keep that core warm. With heat strain, it's doing the opposite. Uh, it's saying, wow, it's getting hot. We need to protect the organs from this heat. And so it moves blood to the skin. Sometimes that's why your your skin may appear more reddish when you're hot is because it's it's sending that blood to the extremities. There's another benefit to that besides keep trying to keep the heat away from the core. And that is that you're going to sweat. So when it's cold, you don't really, there's not an opposite of sweating. You're just not sweating. Uh, there is the, well, I would call it goosebumps. <laughs> I would call it goosebumps. But, uh, you know, so like in primates, for example, they have enough hair that when they get goosebumps and that hair stands on end, it creates an extra layer of air, of insulation between the outside air, the cold air, and the skin. And, uh, you know, I'm saying that's not really effective in humans. And you might say, well, Dr. Reed, I know some humans who I think are hairy enough where that is effective. And I'd say, maybe you're right. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there are some pretty hairy people out there, but I still think it's probably not not uh, totally effective. Anyway, <laughs> so when you're hot, getting back to heat, <clears throat> you sweat. And that as that sweat evaporates, it's helping pull heat energy off of your skin basically it's unloading the heat from your body so that's really you're know, moving the the blood to the skin and then sweating is going to be the 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 primary methods for your body trying to control the heat and get rid of it so some things that happen i i won't get into all the details here but uh some of the other responses from your body are are things like an increased heart rate so it tries to move the blood more quickly so that more of that heat hopefully will offload. There are other reasons we won't get into. If you think of dehydration, um, it's related to de dehydration, but uh, I'm not going to explain the, the physiology. And then um, there are other things as well. So uh, as you're dehydrated, then your your blood is um, less diluted. It becomes more concentrated, including the electrolytes in your blood and in your skin. So think about that as we talk about some of the, the measures that um, we're going to look at here. So we wanted to know, can we find a way to, to evaluate the risk of heat strain and heat-related illnesses uh, in, a, in an accurate way and in a convenient and cheap way. I'll talk about some of the issues with the, the other options. So there are hundreds of heat, heat strain, heat stress indices out there. They, some are very complex. Some are, uh, some are very simple. Some are more accurate and some are less accurate, but there's, there are a lot and it's hard to, you know, there's a sea of things that we could look at. Um, one of the issues, though, with looking at and measuring the environment is that each person is going to respond a little bit differently to the heat stress, to all of those things that make them hotter. So really, the when it comes to regulations as well, we have no regulations related to heat strain or, or heat stress. But core temperature... As far as I can tell, as far as I think, you know, it, and also when it comes to, it's not just me, <laughs> when it comes to uh, organizations that work on this, core temperature is uh, the closest thing we have to measuring, uh, to to evaluate uh, evaluating that risk. So if your core temperature is rising to a certain point, almost everyone is going to be uh, in trouble. <laughs> um, we'll put it that way. So I know in uh, Celsius, I'm trying to remember in Fahrenheit, 41 degrees Celsius is the clinical definition for heat stroke. And that's a core temperature of 41 degrees Celsius. So the skin may be cooler than that. Uh, it's something like 104, I think 104 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So let's talk about some of the options for measuring core temperature. The clinical, the official clinical definition for measuring core temperature is in the pulmonary artery. Let me explain a little bit about what that is. So the as blood returns to your heart through the vein, venous system, through the veins, it goes to, uh, there's an atrium and then a ventricle. Uh, I think it's the right ventricle. So the, not that that's important, but uh, the ventricles send blood out of the heart. So it enters that ventricle. It gets sent to the lungs. So from the heart, it goes to the lungs to pick up oxygen and throw away CO2 and other stuff, you know, waste and get oxygen. So it comes to the lungs to pick up oxygen. Then it comes back to the heart on the left side, ends up in the left ventricle, and then goes to the rest of the body. The pulmonary artery is that is uh, is <laughs> that connection between the heart to the lungs. You can imagine how often we measure that. <laughs> It's it's not very often that you could get, say, a thermometer. That's defined as your core is between the heart and the lungs, the that uh, artery. That's hard to measure, uh, even in a clinical setting. Uh, we not we don't measure that with, you know with people walking around. Uh, that's just not possible. Another option that has been developed is a rectal probe. Not a lot of people volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, for that to wear that over eight hours, uh, you know, during the day, uh, just not going to get a lot of people, you know, and I think most of us are, you know, understand <laughs> their, uh, their, um, reluctance to wear it. And then there are ingestible sensors. So that's what this is right here. It's a pill that you swallow coated in silicone, uh, and it has, it has a thermometer, a battery, and a transceiver inside. So basically, while this pill navigates your intestines, it's sending out readings of the temperature inside your intestines. So that you know, uh, it's a little bit better. It's getting closer, but there's still issues with this. A lot of people don't want to swallow that pill. I've swallowed it. Um, I. But I can see why people would be uncomfortable swallowing a, a machine with a battery inside. Uh, you know, not uh, not necessarily a pleasant thought. Um, or is there something else? So that's what our goal was with this. Uh, so this is a different mine. Uh, you know, some mines you just drive right in instead of uh, going down a shaft. Um, so I'm going to go, you know, go quickly through some of this. I want to get to you know some of the take home messages here, but. Talk about we just talked about some of the current technologies for heat strain monitoring. I'm gonna I'm gonna put some numbers to those and talk about some of the future opportunities. So <clears throat> I talked about that mine. 180 degrees Fahrenheit, rock surf temperatures. Why? So there are mines that are deep that are not hot. They may even be cold. It's not so much a question of depth. Now, if you got deep enough, yes. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to be cold. Your mind is not going to be cold. 7,000 feet, it's deep, but compared to the the depth of the earth, uh, it's not that deep. <laughs> We're still like scratching the surface, basically. So so what it really is, is uh, the geology. So the rock beneath this mine is very dense, apparently. And dense rock conveys or transfers heat energy from the core more efficiently than rock that is less dense. So, so think about it, it has less insulation against uh, heat from the core of the earth. That's why this mine is so hot. Uh, in underground mines, I'll be honest, so <laughs> I haven't been to mines that have both surface and underground, just one or the other, but I've heard people say, and I've seen this myself just being at different mines, you can always tell which mines are surface versus underground by looking at the workers. Uh, in surface mines, it's all very mechanized. So heavy equipment, those huge haul trucks. I have a picture of one huge haul trucks, you know, the size of a two story building. They're driving those. They have shovels that are massive. You know, the largest machine on earth is a, a shovel in Germany uh, that uh, I can't remember how big it is, but I mean, it, it, it moves mountains by itself. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so everything is mechanized, huge equipment, all this stuff. 
underground, you can't fit all that stuff. <laughs> and and a lot of the work is still done physically <laughs> by people. And so when you look at the workers, surface workers, uh, you know, a little bit more overweight and, uh, and, um, they probably have a more of a tan, <laughs> more of a tan. And then underground, sometimes they either look like bodybuilders or like they're emaciated. <laughs> you kind of get, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a stark contrast because they're, and they probably don't have a tan. They might look, you know, I mean, if it was me, I would look even more white and pasty. Um, so that you, you, you can kind of tell the environment. So these workers are, doing hard labor underground. So they tend to have higher metabolic rates. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, there's some other information here. Um, there's, uh, you know, some, some issues with ventilation also that make it in, in underground metal mines, heat strain, more of an issue. So <laughs> rectal probe is invasive and impractical. We, we're not even talking about the pulmonary artery thing. That's just not an option. Ingestible sensors can be expensive. So they are about $50 a pop. And uh and there's there's some issues with using them. So if if the pill is still in the stomach and someone takes a drink or eats something, then the temperature drops. You can see it on the graph. It, you know, it'll drop way down. And that's messing up our measurements, our estimation of their core temperature. There's this is a like a heat strain index sort of, but it's a model that was developed. Um, you know, it has decent accuracy, but not great. Uh, and then there are some who have looked at measuring skin temperature, and it, it's it's not bad. So so this error right here is the root mean square error. I like root mean square error because it tells us how far off we are in the units that we're interested in. And so this is, this says that we are off 0.28 degrees Celsius. I'll talk about why that may be good or bad in a moment. Uh, looking at heart rate down to 0.21. So a little bit better. You, we we want to be as close to zero. My goal would be 0 0.05 degrees Celsius. Uh, and then some people who have looked at multiple multiple measures of physiology, 0.18. So getting closer, the thing is, is the, so this is the ACGIH TLV. Don't worry about it, what that means exactly, except that what this is, is it means we should keep the core temperature at 37 degrees plus or minus one degree Celsius. So that's how much wiggle room we have. We, we can move one degree celsius and be okay that's why i say 28 percent, 21 percent, 18 percent. so it's an 18 percent error when we have you know it's it's point at 18 degrees when we have one degree of wiggle room so it's it's not as sensitive it's not as accurate as i personally would like when we're trying to figure out how at risk someone is for these heat related illnesses so i don't want to get too much into the weeds here I'd like to have some Q and A at the end, but um, the idea is: well, what if we could take something like a Fitbit, some sort of fitness tracker, and measure external physiology, and then use advanced, uh, you know, more modern machine learning techniques to estimate core temperature? We could look at heart rate, respiration rate with some of these systems, uh, not necessarily wrist worn, skin temperature acceleration so we have a, a an accelerometer on these things and then some systems have galvanic skin response so that is essentially it's a way of looking at hydration in the skin and <laughs> when i first put this together it was you know it's been several years probably artificial neural networks were kind of a new thing uh, now they're we have even more uh, advanced machine learning techniques. But uh, the idea is this, that if Google or Facebook or App or whoever or you know, Tesla, if they can use machine learning to drive a car for image recognition, all of these things, surely we could use them to take things like heart rate and skin temperature and estimate someone's core body temperature. 
So I am not going to get into the weeds on these, but it's really interesting that they're modeled after the way the brain works. So you know, really cool technology. So we did a little pilot study here. Uh, this is, we had one worker who agreed to this. So he wore this, uh, this system. It has a chest strap. Uh, this, these finger probes were for galvanic skin response. So it was measuring electrolytes basically in the skin. We also measured heart rate. It measures respiration rate, skin temperature, and acceleration in three on the three accurate uh, axes. And we, we also had the ingestible sensor so we could measure his core temperature as he was doing work. So it, that that's, that's okay. <laughs> uh, so I'll show you an example of some of the data. Uh, so I, I am not a programming wizard. I used the MATLAB neural network toolbox and I used uh, the time series based uh, neural network there. Um, try different variations. And then as a comparison, I used the rapid minor auto model feature. Again, I'm not a wizard. Um, so that one's nice because it just, it does you know, a lot of the heavy lifting out. You'll click some boxes and it'll try different models and, and it'll tell you how they did. Uh, so this is an example of the raw data. The red here is core temperature. And on this one, we don't have an example of when they take a drink or something and it's still in the gut, but you'd see something like this. Whoops. Um, you know, a, a huge drop and then slowly coming back over time. And so we kind of miss in this window, we would miss, we would miss, a. Uh, any data that might alert us to an, you know, an emergency if their core temperature was getting too high. So that's one issue with the, the ingestible pills. Uh, we won't look at all the other data. So so ours, this was just a, one sample, but uh, you know, more data could make it better or worse. I, you know, I don't know. We'd have to see. But we got down to a root mean square error of 0.068. You know, these were the... Uh, the other models from the rapid miner, uh, you know, auto model. <laughs> um, so not, not quite as good. And then this was the R squared for our, so 0.976, pretty good for the neural network and the other options, not quite as good. This is what the regression line looked like. So pretty good. Um, I'm not going to worry about that one. I don't want to get too, too technical in this. It was a size of one, so <laughs> we can't really generalize it. It might improve with more data. It might not. It's kind of tricky like that. Machine learning doesn't always improve with more data. So there's a lot more work to do here, but uh, we think there's a lot of potential here. And, you know, not all. So we had galvanic skin response and we had uh, uh, respiration rate, which most Fitness trackers, especially those worn on the wrist, are not going to do. They may have skin temperature. They're going to have heart rate, almost all of them. Uh, and then almost all of them will also have an accelerometer in three axes. So those data we know we could collect uh, with almost any sort of sensor. So uh, this is this is some of the work that uh, was done before we did this study. Uh, again, we were trying to help out with um, with the heat strain issue with these uh, people working in that environment for for twelve hour shifts. That's another thing they do twelve hour shifts, fourteen days straight, <laughs> and then they get seven days off. It was kind of an intense work schedule. So I want to talk about this sort of so what or what if of this. Uh, you know, so it's interesting work. It's great, but the why, you know, this, this picture is kind of, it's kind of a cheesy picture, but, uh, but I want to stop and think for a minute about what was involved, all of the processes, the industries, the people, the workers involved in you flipping the, the light switch and the lights coming on. So I forget this, even though I, I'm acutely aware, I, so a, a little anecdote when I started when I was first involved with mining uh, and industrial hygiene. Uh, so I was at a copper mine 
And I know modern pennies are not made with copper, but when I saw a penny, it made me look at it differently <laughs> because it seems this little insignificant thing. But once I started to get an idea of what was involved in producing that penny, it really it made me not want to throw, not not want to lose a penny, <laughs> you know, and, and other things. I mean, I'm thinking of um, uh, just say I don't know. There's some metal in some packaging for something. It was metal because I'm familiar with the you know that process of extracting and refining metals, and so any metals I I view differently, and I it was it was like painful to throw it in the trash. <laughs> uh, the same applies though to plastics and other things. There's a huge process and a huge effort behind all of those things to make them possible. With us flipping the light switch. There's a, well, we can look at multiple angles here, but um, in mining, someone has to extract the copper, refine the copper, produce wiring for it uh, on the energy side. Uh, you know, it's either coal mining or oil extraction or, and if we go to renewables, then there's still lots of mining behind that to produce the metals and the chemicals that are required to make solar panels, for example, a huge process uh, with oil, we get our plastics that are going to be involved. So our insulation as well for those wires. And then you have the 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 power plant. So they're either like, so if it's a power plant, it's going to be nuclear, which you've got to mine their uranium. You've got uh, you've got coal fired, you've got gas fired power plants, all of these things to produce that. And then you have, even though you have, we have the infrastructure, we have the electrical lines and power lines and things. You have to have somebody to maintain those. I actually, I have a cousin who's a lineman for, um, uh, well, for a, a utility company, uh, not far from where I live. And, uh, he's, we have a winter storm coming and he's going to be out there while there's ice and snow and all this stuff. And, uh, they're in a little, you know, a little snow crawler, um, what do they call it? A snow cat, <laughs> a snow cat out there monitoring the lines and fixing them if they go down so that people can have electricity. And, and anyway, so there are so many things <laughs> there. I, I would estimate that when you flip the light switch, there are at least 10,000 people who are involved in making that possible. And not that we have to dwell on them every time we flip the light switch <laughs> like i said i i forget to like stop and think but but there were probably at least ten thousand people directly involved in making that possible when we flip the light switch on and and my goal and i think in general for industrial hygiene for occupational health and safety the goal is to make sure that the people who who dedicate their career and their life to doing those sorts of jobs they can come home safe every day to their family. And when they have grandkids, they can play with their grandkids. They can hear their grandkids. They can enjoy their retirement. That is our goal. Is uh, And that's the why anyway for me. Why do I do what I do? It's it's that. <laughs> to make sure that those people uh, you know, can enjoy their family in their later years. So that's all I got, except for questions and comments and anything else. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Reed. That was an amazing presentation. We will now open the floor. If anyone has any questions or just general comments about Dr. Reed's presentation, please, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. And I see we have one already. So yeah, Lily, thanks for your, your comments. No worries that you got to run. Uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, and you're welcome, Sarah. Thank you for being here. Yes, thank you all for joining us today. If you have questions or you want to reach out with uh, comments or anything, then feel free to send me an email. Well, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. If we don't have any other questions, we're going to go ahead and close it out. Thank you, everyone, for joining us so today. And also thank you, Dr. Reed. You're and very everyone, welcome. you have a wonderful day. Thanks, Kayla. Thank you.